now time for the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show brings you famous celebrities and amazing people from all over the world. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. So sit back and relax and enjoy the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. Download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor FM. Also, watch the interview on YouTube and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show channel. And take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with a wonderful author and publisher from New York. He's a New York born and raised author and publisher of Rock Hill Publishing. He's an independent author and publisher. He's got four books in print with two more due out in the year, working on the Killer Search, which is a four-book crime novel, and one and two have have reached five-star reviews. We'll talk about that. Also in progress, the Gemstone series, and also uh, the Emerald Lady, the Ruby Crable, and, um, and and I guess there's just a lot more to talk about. Here he is, the writing machine of great New York City, ladies and gentlemen, the fine owner and publisher of Rock Hill Publishing, James Hill. James, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, right, thank you, Mike. How are you? Good to hey, I'm, hey, I'm doing great, doing great. So you've been uh, born and raised in the Bronx. You're a native New Yorker, and uh, you're the author and publisher of Rock Hill Publishing, and you have quite a number of books out, which is the uh, killer series, a four-book crime novel, which one and two have received five-star reviews. You're also working on the Gemstone series, the Emerald Lady, Ruby Crable, and also in particular, you wrote uh, Killer with a Heart, Killer with uh, Three Heads, and uh, Pegasus Journey to Eden. Now, before we get to some of the books, uh, tell us how you got started. Well, like I started writing at a very young age. I used to uh, buy comics, you know, the Marvel series, and we would read the comics, and then we would trace out the, the characters and try to write the next uh, next story in the in the comic line. We always oh, wow. To, yeah. We try to beat Stan Lee at his own game. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the days of tracing characters and everything else. That was a lot of fun, and you just triggered a really good memory right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's what really got me started into writing. And uh, my father used to tell me that I talk so much I even talk to myself, which I did <laughs> because I always had the characters going around in my head. And I'd be having conversations, and they'd be having conversation with each other, other mm-hmm. characters in my head. So I always had this vivid imagination and and sort of like living out these fantasies. And sooner or later, they just became stories that I had to write down. That is amazing. And at least they're having a staff meeting, which they do get results, which is good. So when you talk to yourself in characters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the worst part is when they argue. <laughs> there you go, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 of course, uh, you spent 12 years of Catholic education, a couple more in uh, college years as well, too, gave you a unique moral compass. And uh, maybe just uh, tell us about uh, some, some of those adventures that were influencing your books as well, too. Oh, yes. Uh, well, what I did was in, in high school, and this is going back to the Killer series because a lot of it takes place as teenagers growing up in the Bronx. So some of the high school stuff that went on and some of the things that we learned is actually reflected in the Killer series. Uh, I went to 12 years of Catholic school and part of my time in Catholic school, I was um, a heretic. (laughs) Some of the priests priests and brothers felt felt I was a heretic. Um, But what what happened was, we would go to religion class every day, of course, and no one ever does their religion homework, let's face it. <laughs> we had to carry our our Bible, though, back and forth to school, and the only thing they would check on when you're going out the door of, of, of high school, I went to Cardinal Hayes, 
shout out to Colonel Hayes of the Bronx. And uh, they would open up your bag and look in there to see if you were carrying your Bible. Now, the Bible was like this thick. You know, what wow. a big brown, full Old Testament, New Testament, the whole deal. Mm-hmm. So I found at that time the Lord of the Rings, which was the same, almost the same size and had the same brown cover to it. And that's how I wound up reading The Lord of the Rings, because I would carry that book back and forth instead of the Bible, and I'd be reading The Lord of the Rings instead of doing my religion homework. So you kind of, so you kind of snuck that in there as well, too. And uh, and I'm sure uh, Gandalf was like, you know, you shall not pass. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And of course, Led Zeppelin Ramble On, you know, when they started, when Led Zeppelin Ramble On came out and they were singing, and, you know, I'm like, hey, that's about The Lord of the Rings. You know what? I need to read this book. That's not carrying it back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that is something. And and of course, you also got involved too with some uh, computers as well too. Besides your short stories, and uh, you work in the financial industry and um, computer programming. And um, you can just uh, tell us a little bit about that as well too. Yeah. Um, back in again, back in high school, my mom worked for a bank. She was uh, in check processing, and this is around 74, 73, something like that. And my school came up. We were one of the first schools to actually be teaching uh, computer sciences, you know, programs oh, wow. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And my mom was working on this sort program. Uh, back in the day when we had checks, I mean, we still have them. But what you would do is, uh, what the banks would do, they would sort them out according to where they were going. Mm-hmm. So all the local banks would go into one batch. And then as you get further and further out, you put them in further and further batches because they have to be sent sent to the FRBs. So Uh I worked out a sort pattern for her that made it very fast to get all of the local checks in first because they had to be sent out by like 9 o'clock or something. And then the later checks, like the West Coast checks, they didn't have to be sent out to 12. So I worked out the sort pattern for her. And funny thing is, I wound up working in her department in – check processing when I graduated high school. Oh, and, my goodness. <laughs> because I knew the sort pattern. <laughs> uh-huh. And, and I and I think in those days, too, like in computer science, you had those uh, sorting machines, like those punch cards. I think I remember those. That's kind of like a flashback in a sense. Oh, yeah. One of the fun things to do was, uh, and you learned this early on, is the number of your punch cards. And I even worked on paper tape in my high school Everything was on paper tape, so we would have these long ticker tapes of programming. So you type it out on like a teletype, type mm-hmm. it in, and you run it through, and it make the paper tape. But uh, in college, we had the punch cards, and of course, you learn very early on to uh, have it print the number of the cards on, because you get these big trays of cards and everything, and then someone bumps into you, and the tray go flying, and the cards are all over the place. Oh no. And then your program never going to work. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I guess there was some details right there. You know, I can imagine if they tried those uh, punch cards today and be a lot of punching as well, too. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Now, when I worked in the bank, uh, one of the people who was running the machine, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is one of the reasons why I had to go back to college and actually get a degree in programming, because I figured I can work my way into the programming department and this and that, you know, just because I knew programming. I was, mm-hmm. one, I would say, probably one of the first persons to write a virus back Uh-oh. in high <laughs> Well, it, you know, the first thing you learn is all the bad things you can do with a computer. Then you, then you practice on all the good things you can do. But this guy, he was working in the bank, and he dropped a tray of checks. Oh, my. And now these checks are all sorted by where they should be going, what banks they should be going, what FRBs were sending them to the Federal Reserve Boards. Uh, the Federal Reserve Banks is the one who cleared the check. So in the banking industry, you get paid by how much money the banks get paid interest on how much money they deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank. It's all about interest with the banks. Everybody does interest. Mm -hmm. This guy one day, he dropped the tray of checks. And I'm talking thousands of checks. Oh, my. And he just swept them up and stuck them back in the box. And hence, and we're, and we're sending these checks out. We're the ones who have to proof them and send them out. And we realized right away, oh, these checks are 
badly messed up. <laughs> but, you know, they was on our back to get the checks out, get them out. And our job was you only had to check the first check and the last check in the batch to make sure it matched. So we did that. We checked the dollar amounts and wrapped them up and sent them. And that day, the whole thing rejected. The oh, F- my goodness. Rejected them all. <laughs> going to run through their sort of machine. Yeah, the checks are not going where they're supposed to go and all this kind of stuff. You know, they, they got routing numbers on them, of course. And mm-hmm. they should be routed to New Jersey or Connecticut or this. Well, some of them are going to Pennsylvania. Some of them are going to California. Some of them go to Ohio. So naturally, you know, millions of dollars worth of a deposit got uh, rejected. And they oh, don't no. check back. They, they go ahead and process them for you and charge you. So not only do you not get the interest, but now you're getting a charge from the Federal Reserve Bank because they have to resort the checks. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so and we, I, I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, you, you're, you're saying? So I, said, I was going to say, needless to say, uh, the next morning when I woke in, w- walked in, because this is all done at night, so the next evening when I walked in, uh, all the big managers and stuff for the bank is in there, and they oh. are ripping my boss royally <laughs> for this, oh, no. for this, for this uh, mishap. A couple of them. There uh-huh. were mishaps in, in the banking industry and then finance it. But that was that was my impetus to get out of finances so much and get into programming, which is what I really like. So I wound up going back to college, getting a degree, and then I've been writing programs for the Navy, the government, uh, private industry, health care. So I've been back and forth all over the map, California to to uh, Virginia. I live in Virginia now, so okay. Each. It's a big that, Navy town, big military town, so there's lots of uh, government work here. Mm-hmm. That is amazing, too. And, of course, your background uh, in uh, computer word processing uh, gets into your uh, your current profession as an author. We'll talk about your books in a minute. You listen to The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable console web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. Also, download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor FM. Also, watch the interview on YouTube on the Mike Wagner Show channel. Make sure you subscribe. Also, download the Mike Wagner Show anywhere you go on any mobile device. We're here with um, New York born and raised author and publisher of Rock Hill Publishing, James Hill, now currently in Virginia Beach, Virginia, talking about... Um, some of his background as well, too, which led him right now to uh, writing some really good books and starring off with uh, the Killer series and uh, Killer with a Heart. You can just uh, tell us all about it. All right. The Killer with a Heart takes us back to New York in the 70s, and it's about the mob and gangs. Coming up in the 70s, uh, I knew a few people here and there uh, in in various professions in life. <laughs> and... I got out of gangs really early in in my life. Um, it was like a very unwise thing to do to be a member of a gang. But when I was coming up in the South Bronx, you had to be a member of a gang in order just to cross the street to go to the store. Mm. That's how prevalent gangs were at that time. And you couldn't pretty much leave your block if you didn't have friends with you. But right. uh, then when I moved out of that area and we moved uh, further uptown, I wound up in somewhat of a mob control neighborhood, a uh, mixed neighborhood, Italian, Irish, German. Uh, we were one of the first black families to move into the neighborhood. Funny thing is, my mom grew up in that neighborhood. Interesting. Yeah. So where her house was, the highway now ran. When she was a little girl, she lived at the bottom of, um, I think it was St. Lawrence Avenue, she said. But mm-hmm. now the bottom of St. Lawrence Avenue is a highway. So when she grew up in the neighborhood, uh, back as a kid. So we moved back to that neighborhood. And um, very interesting place. Like I said, knew some people here and there, various uh, 
affiliations. <laughs> and so the Killer with the Heart series is about the Killer with the Heart book is like the beginning of the series. It's how these two teenagers get together and they decide to rob a money drop, a, a, a numbers a numbers drop. And so the guy, Nicky, Nicky Nails, he's the son of a mobster and he's just waiting to become the, uh, get into the family. Now, you, you don't really get to join the mob until you're over 18 because they don't want somebody in there who can turn on them. And if you was under 18, you really wouldn't face any kind of uh, legal problems for what you did. Same and it was a little bit different for the gang because the gangs would take you in as a young kid for just that reason. So the gangs will have you carrying the guns and the weapons and stuff because if you get arrested, you're only going to go to youth house. They can't, at that time, they couldn't charge you with anything serious. Mm -hmm. I want to do over 18 because in case you turned on a mob, they would turn you into the police and you would go to jail for for quite a long time. Uh, the idea of uh, the blood in deal with the mob was everybody used to think, oh, yeah, you had to drink blood and stuff like that. But no, to be made a made man, to get into the mob, they usually wanted you to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. That was the blood in for the mob. So mm -hmm. you kill somebody and then they have that information and that stuff over your head. One of my favorite scenes from The Godfather is the beginning of The Godfather when they drive the guy out there to Long Island. And this is some somewhat of how the mob worked. It would like it would be easier to get somebody you know to kill you than to get somebody you didn't know to kill you. So when it came time, they wanted to make the guy who was going to become a made man, get his bones. And so he drives out, and I forget the name of the character, but the big fat guy, he gets out the car, says he's going to go take a leak, and he leaves the other guy sitting in the back of the, back of the seat with the driver. Of course, the driver is the one they kill, so he shoots the guy in the back of the head, he gets out the car, and the guy tells him, hey, Leave the gun, take the cannolis. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make me hungry for cannolis, I'll tell you that. <laughs> now, I had a friend when I worked in the bank. Uh, he was uh, one of my bosses, and we used to call him the Godfather because uh, he was well he was well hooked up. And we used to drive around in Paul Castellano's car. He had Big Paulie's car because... Uh, when Pig Paulie got shot, the car went to him. Mm -hmm. So one day, Pat, he tells me, you know, we're, we're, I used to ride home with him because I worked, like I said, I worked in the same job my mom worked in. And this was one of the people who was working in the job. Because the mob also told you, you know, you have to keep up appearances so you would get a regular job and stuff. Give me just uh -huh. one second. It's raining like cats and dogs here, and I hear it bouncing off my window. I don't know if you can hear it. I was going to say, do you have your windows open? Yeah, I got to close them. Give me one okay, second. Okay, sounds good. While you're doing that, uh, we'd like to take time out and say listen to the Mike Wagner Show, the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs at below the competition web. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Michael Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show. Can you hear on the MikeWagnerShow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. Also, download and listen on Facebook, Sound, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Instagram. Also, you can also... um. Check out the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with um, James Hill, the author and publisher of Rock Publishing. We were talking about uh, his first book, Killer with a Heart. And um, I think there was a little more we talked about before the rain started coming down. And, um, and and I think we're trying to figure where we left off, something to do about The Godfather. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is Virginia. So all of a sudden it starts to rain on you. And I had to close the window. But anyway, what I was saying was my cannoli story mm -hmm. is uh, I I'm riding home with Pat one night. And Pat tells me, hey, and it's like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And Pat told me, hey, you want to go for some cannolis? You know, want to swing through Little Italy, we'll pick up some cannolis. 
And I told him, hey, Pat, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. There's no place going to be open. <laughs> in fact, the places are always open for the Godfather. Deal with the Godfather. Don't worry about it. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> yeah, so we pull up to the back of some place in an alley, back of this place. And he just toots a horn one second, you know. And this little old Italian guy comes shuffling out to the car. And Pat tells him, bring me my bag. And bring him a bag of cannolis. And now I'm sitting there with my face, with my hard look on. I have my sunglasses on, because at that time I always wore sunglasses, mm -hmm. even at night. <laughs> and I'm sitting there with my sunglasses on, trying to look real hard and everything. And the guy looks over across the car at me and he tells Pat, Who's he? Pat reaches out, grab the guy by the throat, bam. Bangs his head against the car. Oh. And go, another mind who's he? You go get my bag and bring him a bag of cannolis. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> so the guy shuffles back off as fast as he can. He goes in. He comes out about two minutes later. He got these two white bags, you know. Uh -huh. And Pat, he just sits, he rolls up the window. So the guy shuffles around the car, comes to the other side of the caddy. And I sit there, I just roll the the window down you know down comes the window and i'm just sitting there like i'm not reaching out to take anything so the guy reaches over he puts the two bags in my lap i just <laughs> roll up the window. i don't say anything i roll up the window we start driving off so i'm looking around you know not to kind of i'm trying not to be conspicuous just kind mm -hmm. of look at the mirrors you know are we being followed or anything like that and we get on the fdr the highway you know the FDR was so I heading uptown. So I say, All right, no one's behind us. So I say to Pat, All right, Pat, what's in the bags? And Pat go, A cannoli, pass me one. And you know, <laughs> I feel the heat through the bag. So I'm like, All right, pass me a cannoli. I take cannoli. All right, Pat, what's in the other bag? <laughs> 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 Don't worry about that. I said, oh, I'm not really worried. I just want to know if I all of a sudden see flashing lights and everything. Do I take the bag and jump in the East River? Because I'm really not a swimmer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, and Pat go, hey, you're riding with the Godfather. Don't worry about it. We got great lawyers. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, I guess so. And so we get uptown and everything. And then my mom is like mad because she's like, where have y'all been? You know, it's late. And I'm like, uh, we stopped for the cannolis. And she goes, you stopped for Pat, you took him on a, on a run? I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, Ma, take it easy. I've been in worse places than that. This was pretty tame. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my Cannoli story. So the story of um, Killer with a Heart is how these two boys, one of them is a mob, is a mobster, son of a mobster. The other one is a gang lord. And this is how they get together and how they begin their life of crime, so to speak. And the reason why I wrote the this story is because I wanted people to understand that people like that aren't just made. They just all of a sudden become, you know, the Don. They usually start off very early in life, very criminally minded in life, and then they grow from there. And this is where the story starts with mm -hmm. Kill with the Heart. So that's that's the reason behind Kill with the Heart. That was amazing too. This also led to uh Killer with Three Heads and um Many more. I'll talk more about that. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Looking for a professional website without breaking your budget? Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor FM, and watch the interview on the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. Just subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show. Also, take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with New York uh, born and raised James Hill, the author and publisher of Rock Hill Publishing, now in Virginia Beach, Virginia. We just got done talking about Killer with a Heart, which uh, begins at daybreak early uh, 1971, which is uh, 
part of his stories as well, too, talking about the mafia and um, with kids, uh, you know, starting their careers. Now we're into um, Killer with uh, Three Heads, where Bulletproof Morris, as best known as, returns to New York as John Morrison, 10 Years of Absence. And um, you can just uh, tell us all about it from there. Okay. So in Killer with Three Heads, it's the, Killer with Three Heads is the book I initially wanted to write. This is the story, the central story of the series. And um, after Killer with the Heart, Morris goes off and he's a he's a an enforcer for the mob. He's a working for the government in the war on drugs in South America. And he's also doing what he loves to do, which is um, building building weapons. So he becomes this weapons, uh, this weapons dealer. So mm -hmm. he's becoming an international criminal. So in the few years between the end of Killer with a Heart and the beginning of this book, he disappears and no one knows what happened to him. And he comes back, it's like 10 years later, he comes back because they kidnapped his daughter. He had the daughter and, and Killer with a Heart and then Killer with Three Heads, the daughter's now older, like around 10, 12 years old, and someone had kidnapped her. And so all of a sudden, Morris shows up in New York to get up with his old friend, Nikki, and find out how come they kidnapped, who kidnapped his daughter. And he believes it was the mob, and Nikki is telling him, no, no, it's not the New York mob. They wouldn't do that because I would kill anybody who, who did it. Uh, Nikki is the little girl's godfather, of course. In, in Morris's absence, he'd been looking after her and looking after her mom and everything. Mm -hmm. So the, the story kind of like revolves around that kidnapping and what Morris will do to the people when he finds out. Now, the thing is, you don't know whether it was the mafia who kidnapped her, whether it was the government because of uh, his involvement with um, the war on drugs, or if it was some other government because of his involvement with weapons dealing. And so it goes sort of like through uh, who done it, tracking down these different people. And the thing about the Killer series is they believe in revenge. And it's all about loyalty and revenge. And so they're loyal to each other and they will do anything for each other, for the family, for the gang. And of course, they will do anything to somebody who went against them. And mm -hmm. so we get into this idea of now he's going to find these people and no matter what it takes, he will have his revenge for them kidnapping his daughter. And of course, he has to deal with the drug lords as well, too, and uh, just gets into another um, area as well, too. It's like, you know, with the drug lords, in your opinion, more powerful than mob equal or less powerful, the drug lords? They, they are kind of like on the same par as the mafia. <laughs> Because you have mm -hmm. the Colombians, and at that time, uh, it was a big push with the Colombian cocaine and everything and the war on drugs. And part of the story tells you a little bit about the war on drugs, how it wasn't so much to stop the flow of drugs as it was to destabilize uh, South American countries, uh, namely Venezuela. Because Venezuela has one of the biggest oil supplies in the world, bigger mm -hmm. than the Middle East. And at this time, in the late 70s, early 80s, America is losing their hold on the Middle East. And they know that sooner or later with the radical Islam and the different things going on in the Middle East, they're going to wind up losing their hold on, on that oil. And so they turn their attention to Venezuela. And using the idea of this war on drugs, they intend to destabilize the governments in Venezuela, uh, Colombia, and use that as an excuse to get into into uh into these areas and take over the oil industry that so, that's a, it sounds like that's what's happening right now as well too that uh saying there's a drug war going on in reality it's kind of set up so the u.s can take over the uh, oil industry that's what it sounds like yeah because if you notice we never really stopped drugs from flowing it is not because we can't but there's just no real impetus in doing it. What we're more interested in is what other resources these, these countries have. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, setting up puppet governments and things like that. The same thing we've been doing in the Middle East. Uh, we proffered up a bunch of uh, dictators and stuff like that. 
And they're all great until they turn against us, you know, bite the hand that feeds you. And the next thing you know, you know, we're dropping bombs on these people. So, uh -huh. so it's, uh, and the same thing goes on in South America and almost everywhere in the world. It, the governments aren't really interested in stopping crime and making people's lives better. They're more interested in what they can get out of that government, out of that area. Mm -hmm. and, and do you suppose anytime soon the other countries will be coming for the United States uh, to take over our oil, you know, especially up in the uh, Bakken as well, too, around, um, around the North Dakota region? That's where some of the um, oil is, and especially up in Canada, around uh, Edmonton and, and Alberta as well. Yeah, and, and we have to watch our interests. And, of course, Alaska, like you said, northern Canada, the gas lines. Uh, all these things, this is where governments are interested in. You know, sure, the drug business is the multi-billion dollar business, but think how much money there is in oil, how many billions and billions of dollars there are in oil. And so much so that uh, the governments have fallen, have risen and fallen over that type of thing. Going all the way back to the Crimea, you know, with the Russians and everything, they've been trying to take the Crimea and why? Because the Crimea is also loaded with gas and oil. That, and, uh, and, yeah. That is amazing, too. And, um, you know, our countries have it as well, too. And just makes you wonder. It's like, you know, what else can they offer as well? Too? It's like, you know, why, why can't they offer something else? I guess that's a big question nowadays. Almost like what's playing nowadays in um, world politics right now. Yeah. Um, and the thing with oil is, at one point, we weren't even going to be an oil-based uh, economy. We were going to be a solar-based economy because they had solar power, and they were working on that back in the early uh, 1900s, and they showed how profitable and how easy it was to use solar energy to generate steam, to power steam and produce electricity. And just as that thing was getting started, they struck oil in the desert. And solar power went, you know, away because, hey, it's just much easier to, to pump this stuff out the ground and use it than it is to build these gigantic uh, steam producing factories and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, not every place in the world can use solar power steam. You have to be in places where it's pretty hot. You know, mm -hmm. you can't move this stuff around. It, so you have to generate the, the steam power and stuff like that in places where you got a lot of sun. I mean, the United States can do it. We got the, the West where we get plenty of sun and plenty of desert area out there. Uh, Middle East have plenty of desert area. You know, there, there are places in the world that could do it and clean energy. Uh, but it's like once they discovered oil, and this is petroleum oil, because remember, before that, the world was running off of, um, like, whale oil and things like that, which is not good for running cars and stuff. It's right. very low grade burning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, of course, I was going to get to the part with the, the stormy seas and also, um, you know, one of your books featuring uh, Pine Lover for, uh, from Virginia bound for England called The Emerald Lady. And, of course, you know, that as like a fancy pirate mermaid love story in the golden age of the pirates on the 17th and 18th centuries, commercial vessels, safe and financial ruin, and um, the mermaid queen. And uh, you can just uh, tell us a little bit about that, going from the mafia over to um, pirates and uh, mermaids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the demo lady I wrote because of the nano right mode. I don't know if you know exactly what that is, but that's the National Novel Writing uh, Month where you write a novel of 50,000 words or more mm -hmm. within a month. And I have never written anything in a month. It always takes me a lot longer because I write, I edit, I go back and forth, write more. But this is like you have to do it in one month time and you get to wow. 50,000 words. So it was like, all right, I wanted to do it. I kept saying, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And a couple of times I, it passed me by and I was like, oh, crap. It's already passed, you know, it's already mid-November. Mid so when I finally got on it and I got it in time, I decided I'm going to write something that I haven't written before. Now, I wrote crime stories before. I wrote science fiction stories before. So I said, let me, let, me reach, let me reach and work on something that I have never done before. 
And so I decided I was going to write a fantasy. And I love mm-hmm. pirate stories. I love pirates. I love to see. I have my own sailboat, my own nice. pirate ship. <laughs> Oh, it's amazing, too. I think we talked about the Emerald Lady and also uh, Ruby Cradle. It's uh, coming out of summer as well, too. Maybe just give us a little uh, preview on uh, what to expect from the Ruby Cradle. Yeah. Okay. The Ruby Cradle is the second part of uh, this of the um, Gemstone series. So the Emerald Lady took place in the 17th, 18th century, where the mermaid, where they found the mermaid, and because of what they did, they started a mermaid war mm-hmm. between men, mermaid, and dragons. Of course, they have to have a few dragons thrown in for, for good luck. And then you get to the ruby cradle, which goes back to the age of castles. So the so the, the Emerald Lady is in the age of pirates, piracy, the golden age of piracy. Now, they go back because mermaids live a thousand years, and... In order to defeat the dragons, which they wound up releasing in the Emerald Lady to help them out, they released the last dragon and they saw where all the other dragons were, where their ruby cradles were, because they were all locked up in these, uh, and they went back into like a chrysalis state. And so now the daughter of Jeremy and Shira, it had to figure out how to, uh, how to, Kill the dragons because the dragons are, of course, the real bad guys in the story. Uh, so the Ruby Cradle, she goes back to the grandma, the the queen who got dethroned. She goes to her because she's now the oldest and the one who knows the most about dragons and how to defeat them and how they managed to lock these dragons into their Ruby Cradles to begin with. Mm-hmm. She goes to them and mermaids have telepathy and mental powers. So in order for her to learn what she needed to learn, the grandmother takes her back in time to her mind meld, as you would, and takes her back in time to the age of castles when they was actually fighting the dragons. And so we go back to the go back in time to like the um, the one thousands and the eleven hundreds. And that that's kind of like where it goes. It's sort of like a fantasy historical story these these uh, gemstone series so they they run them in with with history so there is a bit of history in there because i loved history mm-hmm. uh, in school and uh so i mix in history and actual events of what happened but i give my own twist on why these historical events took place and what was the driving forces behind some of this stuff like what was the driving force behind the american revolution uh and it turns out to be the mermaids, the queen of the mermaids, were trying to drive men off the seas and the, and the big ships from the seas. And then what was the driving force behind the building of the empires? It was the dragons who were building the empires, who were controlling men and therefore building these huge empires. And, of course, the detriment of, of mankind. That is so amazing, too. And, of course, this leads on to, as well, one of your other books, Haggis, A Journey to New Eden, you know, going from um, Pirates and Mermaids and um, going on a journey. So it's like you're out in outer space, um, on a shuttle for the other side, Colony 5, Pegasus Workstation, Technology's taking a giant elite four, the Space Spider, and more. You can just uh, tell us a little bit about that book. The Pegasus was by, really, my first sci-fi novel. And I wrote it because my uh, wife at the time asked me, what did I think about the SALT treaties, the treaty between uh, America and Russia? And I was like, well, it's good to have the treaties and everything, but I'm not really worried about a nuclear war breaking out between the superpowers for the main reason, because we don't have a place to go. And it's an unwinnable war. So you're not really going to have a, a... a superpower nuclear war. But what you will have is some rogue state who's ready to bring on Armageddon. And at that point, you might have some sort of nuclear chain that would expand and, and you know, run out of control. I said, but even that probably won't happen until we find someplace else to go. We only have one Earth. And so my idea was that they build Pegasus, which is the first light ship 
because in space, of course, you can't go anywhere unless you can go at light speed. You know, no one's going anywhere. It, we, we, and now we're finding there are all these other planets around stars and things like that. But you, the, closest, the closest star is the Alpha Centauri system, and that's four years away at light speed. So in, unless you're hitting light speed, you're not going to another planet. Even to go to Mars or something like that, it takes, what, almost a year and a half, something it, like that? It, it does, yeah. And they talked in the news that um, I guess you pay so much for a round trip to Mars, and it almost takes like a year to get there and, uh, what, stay two, three, four weeks, and it takes another year to get back. So you sometimes wonder, did they miscalculate, or are they trying to, um, you know, just trump up some uh, market opportunity? Yeah. So when you talk about space colonization, you're going to first off, you're going to probably colonize the space around the planet. And how are you going to start colonization? You're probably going to build things like prisons. You know, when you ha when you start talking about terrorists and all these people and what will be the easiest way to rid the planet of some of these people, you start building prisons. And let, let, look at what happened with colonization around the world. How mm -hmm. do they start colonizing the new world. They sent prisoners, you know, they sent prisoners to South America, to Australia, you know, the, pir the pilgrims were pretty much kicked out of Europe, you mm -hmm. know, and or, that, or, or just to get away from the king too, for being a, a mega tyrant. Yeah. So, you know, and so when you look at it that way, what's going to be the, the driving force behind um, colonization in the future? Is it going to be some sort of prison system? Is it going to be some sort of uh, indentured servants? Because that's also part of what happens. And so in Pegasus, you get that. You get the idea that you're going to build these, these space colonies around Earth, and then they become autonomous in the fact that whoever builds the colonies controls the people's lives that live there. Or, or get some... Or you get some people that come and uh, they're exiled from their own countries as well, too. That's power colonization. They get, they get exiled from their, their home country. Yep. And so that and so it's a really a dystopian view of the future. And so they build this ship, the Pegasus, which is the first light ship. And what they do is because it's going to be a one-way trip. If you go anywhere in space, you're probably going on a one-way trip. You know, even if you could travel at light speed, you're not going to travel four years to some place and go back for supplies another four years and come back. That's eight years in between the time you land on that planet and come go back again and come back. That's an eight year thing. You cannot afford to run out of material, supply, food, whatever. So you better bring everything you need with you. And that's what the Pegasus does. It cuts up the world and inside the Pegasus they bring entire habitats mm -hmm. with them. So it's and, like and, Noah's Ark. Uh, I was just going to get to Noah's Ark as well, too, where it's going to rain 40 days, 40 nights, and uh, wipe out a good portion of the earth. They bring two by two and everything else, and um, watch an adaptation of it. It's like by the time of 30, 31st day, I'm getting tired of fish, getting tired of breath. This air is stale. It's like, when are we going to land? We need windows. And then they end up prevailing. Right. So that's so that's what Pegasus was. It was a Noah's Ark of sorts because the world was in such bad shape. People were escaping with the idea that they're going to go to this new planet and start up a whole new civilization. And of course, the idea behind Pegasus is you really can't escape yourself. That is a very, very good point. I really do like that. Greatly appreciate it. We're here with James Hill from uh from Rock Hill Publishing, talking about his new books. And uh, let's, um, you know, get to uh, some other things, some of your future projects we talked about. And uh, what does it exactly take to uh, write in different genres and what's it like to be an independent publisher? Well, to be an independent publisher, you have to, first off, you, you want to do it in the right way. You want your authors to reap the benefits of writing because as a writer, I see, and this is why it took me so long to actually get published, because it's very hard to get through to the big five publishing companies. 
And then it's very hard to get any kind of new material through because they're all looking at the dollar sign and we're going to publish what is selling now. So mm. if vampire books are selling, everybody wants to sell vampire books. If you wrote anything else, you're not getting published. If hey. something else is going, you know, and, it, and it's fair because they're putting out a lot of money to put these books out. And so they want to sell what's popular. So as an independent, though, I don't have to necessarily go with what's popular. I can publish what's good. If you write a good book and you tell a good story, then it will sooner or later resonate with people. And I can do that. And I also do it on the same type of thing as the regular publishing company. But I return more of the royalties back to the authors. And what are some of the uh, upcoming works that you have uh, coming up from your uh, company? Okay, um, we have the Noggin, which is a fantasy about um, the girl who winds up on a different planet. She transports it, she teleports to this planet, and the planet is somewhat in the Middle Ages as far as technology goes. So she comes from Earth and she teleports to this planet, unbeknownst to her because she doesn't know anything about how she got there. And the king, the tyrannical king, is chasing down this idea that they're going to be a, a prodigy, a child that's going to dethrone him. And he'd been in power for like 200 years. Wow. And now because of his powers, he gets long life. And so she winds up on the planet and they are after her to uh, kill her because they think she might, she either is the child of prodigy or she going to lead them to the child of prodigy mm. and that is prophecy not prodigy sorry about that prophecy that's okay yeah that that is amazing too and uh what are some of the other genres you're looking to uh to take out as well well we have a historical one coming up which is called the Villela's chronicle the cross and the no the crescent and the cross which is about the fall of constantinople it's a historical novel now the writer for that one zach um, his family, he can trace his family lineage, lineage back to uh, to the fall of Constantinople. So part of his family history is, is uh, if you know anything about Greeks, they love their history. <laughs> I, I, I can tell, too, they're very proud of it as well, too. And uh, where can we all find your books? Uh, my books are online in Amazon and Barnes & Noble and any place else that Fine books are sold, and you can also go to Rock Hill Publishing, all one word, dot com, and um, you can go to the Rock Hill Publishing store and buy the books there. We have them in ebook format, paperback, and hardcover. For me, myself, I like a physical book. I work too many time, too many hours on computers, uh, programming, and stuff like that. So I, I'm really a, a, a paper an ink type person. So mm -hmm. I publish in both uh, paperback and hardcover, but I also publish for people who like to download. And, you know, let's face it, you can have a little phone and have thousands of books there, whereas if you have paperback, you know, you have to have like the shelves and shelves of books. Right, exactly. And that's the way to go as well, too. And uh, I, I currently seeking uh, new authors accepting works or, um, or, oh, yes. or can. Okay. Oh, yeah. and, how, and how they do that? Well, they can go to my website, rockhillpublishing.com, and we have a submission page. And they'll tell you, and on the submission page, it tells you how to how to submit. But you will submit the first two chapters, uh, one in the middle and the end. So we see how your writing style is, what type of story you tell. We need a synopsis. We need a character um, outlines for for the book, so we know who what the characters are in the book. And you submit those uh, those three things. And what we do is when we read them and evaluate them, I have an editor. My editor-in-chief is Athena Paris. She's also a romance novelist. So I published four of her books. Her, uh -huh. latest, her latest one is All I Ever Wanted, which is a two-parter. So it's All I Ever Wanted, Jesse. And uh, the second part will come out probably next year or so. We get really tied up with the publishing part of it. So... It's hard sometimes to get our own work out when we're busy working, uh, publishing other people's stuff. But 
I want to understand. It's it sounds like you got a great uh, repertoire of uh, what's out there. And, uh, you know, just last week before we wrap up, we know you're very busy. And, of course, you know, the um, I guess the Thunder Gods are just uh, rumbling over Virginia Beach. What's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? The best advice I can give to anybody? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, as a writer, do not stop writing. A lot of people who write their first book, they're going to sit there and wait for that book to sell before they write their second book. And that's not the thing to do. After you write your first book, start shopping it around, start looking for publishers, start doing all that kind of stuff, and also start working on your second book. And then after you write the second book, start working on your third book. Do not stop writing, waiting for the gold to roll in, because sometimes it takes years to, for the gold to come. And in the meantime, you wasted a lot of time. So, and sometimes, you know, the first book may not be the best book you wrote. It may take you two or three shots before you really hone your craft. Because let's face it, with practice comes perfect. And you and you build and you build and therefore you get a better sense of writing the more you write. That is amazing. It's amazing advice. And I just wanted to say, James, it's a great honor to have you on uh, the program. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, looking forward to having you on again soon. And do us a favor. Please keep up with us up to date with uh, some of your latest works. I will. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad to be here. You're a great host. And it was a pleasure. And I will let you know when things come out. Like I said, we've got a couple of things we're trying to get out before the end of the summer. And... Um, when I, when, I'll send you a line. I'll drop you a line, let you know what's coming up. I think you have one of my authors coming up on, on your show in a little while. Um, he wrote Mistress of, Mistress of the Rock, Myron, Myron Edwards. Oh, yes. Okay. I think, I think I know who you're talking about. That is coming up, and I'm glad you're making a nice plug. That's who's coming up next. And, um, and, I, and I guess there's more to on the way. So we're looking forward to having Myron on and um, – like to have you on again soon and uh, just keep us up to date. We love what you got. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for listening to the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. Also, become a sponsor of the program and or donate today at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of the Mike Wagner Show. And I-